I'll stay over here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, my name is Christy Perez. I work at IBM. I've been there for a very, very, very long time. I've worked on lots of different things. And right now I'm in our systems group in the Linux Technology Center on the Docker team. So primarily Linux things, Docker things in general, but making Docker work well in power is our main goal. Um, so yeah, we did this talk at DockerCon. I'll let Chris introduce himself. <laughs> Can't you look at the microphone? I'm like trying to put this on here without being too disruptive. Okay. It's more difficult than this. Okay. Is this picking me up at all? A little bit. A little bit. Anyway, uh, I'm Chris. I also work in the Linux Technology Center. I work with Christy. We both work on Docker for Power Stuff, and yeah, that's kind of it. Yo. Yeah, so uh, this is a shorter version of our talk from DockerCon, which is called From Arm to Z, Building, Shipping, and Running a Multi-Platform Docker Swarm. And the From Arm to Z was originally from A to Z, and Chris had the genius and eye-rolling uh, idea to change it from Arm to Z, because our mainframe we call System Z, which is a lowercase c, but anyway. So it's a good play on words and nerdy architecture things. So that's what we're going to talk about today is... Uh, running Docker and Docker containers on different architectures and how you can make that easier for people who do want to do that. And also how you can do that yourself if you want to and sort of some like begging and pleading at the end and a little bit of uh, technical how you can but without too much detail. So um, first we'll go through what exactly we mean when we talk about multi-arch because it's not necessarily only architecture. Um, the biggest problems that we face, the solution that the Docker community has come up with, and then Chris will do a demo, and then if we have time at the end, we'll give a little bit of sort of advice about how you can help or make your project do multi-architecture stuff, and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so first off, what in the world is this multi-architecture thing? What are we talking about? In the scope of this talk, what we mean is getting Docker to run on a variety of different platform and devices. Uh, if you, you can see to the right, possibly, if you squint really hard, these are just a bunch of uh, different architectures that Docker supports, with the exception of MIPS, which we forgot to remove. Uh, some of those include x86, of course, uh, i386, PowerPC, which we work on, 32-bit uh, ARM, 64-bit ARM, and, of course, SP90X. So, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people use, say, uh, AMD64, right? It's pretty much everybody. It's what your laptop. Most, pretty much all laptops run. Uh, anyone out there using ARM? Either variant? No? Any power people or Z people? <laughs> yes? Okay, so fun fact, all of these little processors are all ARM, so how many of you use ARM? <laughs> yeah, audience yeah. participation, raise your hands. The awkward audience participation, it's okay. Uh, so anyway, our goal with all of this is we want the user experience across all of these devices to be the same, no matter if you have just a giant fleet of x86 servers, or you're just hacking away on a Raspberry Pi in a teapot doing something that looks rather dangerous. <laughs> so, all of this, what is the biggest problem with multi-architecture? Uh, in short, the answer is architecture-specific images, but I'll show you a demo of that. Click that, and then, I don't know why that's there, Oops. that's not there, just kidding. Okay, so on the left here, we have just an x86 machine, this is all readable? Okay, uh, x86 machine, it's got uh, 1707, don't worry about the 1708, I'm doing some CLI stuff, it's just running Docker at the moment. So I'm going to do something that you guys should probably be pretty familiar with. You just do a standard Docker run of Ubuntu. Okay, so that gives me back a shell, and I'm in the container at the moment. I can do all sorts of things like hello there, and that does all sorts of container things. So you guys should be pretty used, used to this. And right here I have another terminal, and in here I have an S390X machine, as you can see there. Uh, it is also running Docker. It is running 1707. Pay no attention to the unknown version. Uh, but it is running 1707. 
and I'm going to do the exact same thing. Fiber run, IT, one, two, fiber spellcraft. Oh no, first off, that was cut off on the stream. But, oh no, exec user process calls exec format error. Does anyone have any idea what that means? Okay, we don't, we don't either. But more <laughs> or less, the, uh, the short of it is this Ubuntu image is actually an x86 image. Yeah, so, the magic number at the beginning is not right. Hmm? The magic number at the beginning is not right. Yes, uh, you're correct. Uh, but more or less, so this Ubuntu is uh, an x86 image, and when you try to run it on SDRNDX, that's just not going to work. So uh, to get around this, you have to actually have an architecture-specific image. So for S390X, for instance, I know that there is an Ubuntu, and it exists in S390X slash Ubuntu. So if I do that, everything works like it should. So, why is this a big problem? Uh, first off, it greatly harms usability. So now every single time you do a Docker run, you now have to remember, okay, Docker run, I wanna do Ubuntu, what architecture am I on? Oh, okay, I'm on x86. So where's that image? All right, it's just regular Ubuntu, that's fine. But if you're on something else, like let's say a Raspberry Pi or s 3 x you now have to know, okay, where's that image? Okay, s 3 x slash Ubuntu, or ArmHX slash Ubuntu. And this is a really big problem when uh, you're using just another architecture in general. We get lots of bugs from people just saying, hey, this power image doesn't work. And we're just like, hey, this is, that's because it's an x86 image. So again, the big problem is that the user had to remember every single time now that they're on another architecture. Luckily, Christy has a solution. Yeah. So, oh, that is loud. Um, the way that the Docker community has come up with to sort of deal with this and make it easier for everyone not running just x86 on everything in their labs is something called a manifest list. So I went through a little more history at DockerCon about how this all evolved and how long it's all been there and the different people involved, but I'm going to skip all that today and just say that manifest lists as an idea and as a thing on the registry has existed and the registry support has been there for I think almost two years if not more. So there's manifest list support on a registry and there's manifest list support in your Docker engine. But what is missing is the CLI part, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and that's what I'm working on. Um, but first I wanted to talk about what is a manifest list to get that out of the way. So when we did the demo earlier of what things don't work and you need to remember, like here's the image that I need to run on this platform and where in the heck is it? It's not an S390X, some other user built one that I can use and I don't know where it is. And, it just gets really overwhelming, especially if you happen to run lots of different ARM platforms, which I'm not even clear on all of the many different kinds that there are out there, but it's a huge problem for ARM users, and it's definitely a problem for our users, because stuff for power is a little bit hard to find sometimes. So a manifest list is pretty much just something that you can build that the name of it looks exactly like an image name for what you're used to seeing with a Docker image, and you can just have a manifest list that points to other Docker images. And so then your DevOps person builds all of your images or goes out and does all the hard work of finding all these images and just posts them all into a manifest list. And then from then on out, you can just say, hey users, this is what you need to use, and they don't need to know where these are, they just need to know this, and they don't even need to know that this isn't the name of a Docker image. It's a manifest list, but they don't care, they don't need to care, and you probably don't want to tell them anyway, confuse them. So manifest lists are a way to sort of abstract out this problem and make it go away. Um, and so yeah, those have been around for about two years. Um, oh, and I've just also mentioned that the engine does the pull of the manifest list, thinking that it's either a Docker image or manifest list, and figures out what it is, and then says, okay, well, what's in it? And then it pulls the one that works on your platform. So the engine actually does the work of figuring out which of the layers that it needs to pull. So that supports there. Um, and what I'm working on is the CLI part, which I started working on in October of last year, and Moby has come along, and so the PR was in the Docker repository, and it went through design review, and now it's in the CLI repository. They got split out, and if you don't know what Moby is, then that's fine. You're 
less stressed out than we are. Um, so Docker Manifest, the CLI part, is what I am really close to getting added in. A lot of people in the community really, really want this, so Docker is definitely for it. There's not any pushback on like, no, we don't want this. It's just kind of been a matter of time from Docker engineers that they've had to spend in other places. So this Docker Manifest command will let you do two things. It will let you make that manifest list that I talked about in the previous slide and make users' lives easier. And it will also let you do something that community users have wanted, which is to do a shallow pull of an image. So right now, if you want to do a Docker inspect of an image, it has to already have been pulled onto your system, which means you have to pull a bunch of information about an image that you may or may not actually want to do anything with and then delete it. So the manifest command will actually let you do what people call the shallow pull, and it'll just pull the manifest for one image and not all of the layers, and let you see, you know, these are the layers and their digests, and this is the digest of it, and these, this is the platform that this uh, image will run on. So you can do a shallow pull using the manifest command, or you can create a manifest list. So this is just kind of the workflow of using the manifest CLI command to make that manifest list. And Chris will do, um, show you actually using this when he does the demo, but there are three parts to it. So you do the manifest create, and then the, you can optionally do an annotate, which if you have ARM, do some research, figure out if you need to change that. Sometimes you might, sometimes you might not, it just depends. <laughs> and then you have to push it to a registry. So for manifest lists, they have to live in a registry. They can't be local on your system um, because the Docker engine is going to try and pull that image and it's going to be a manifest list. And so it has to, it's always going to go out and pull a registry first. So in this create command, the first argument is always the name of the manifest list. So this is one that we're making. And then these are the images. Every other argument is going to be the image that you want, the list of images that you want to put in your manifest list. So there's the x86 one, and then an ARM one, an ARM one, a power one, and a mainframe one. So for this manifest list, anybody on any of those platforms can just say Docker run, or put this in a Helm chart, or do whatever they want, and use it just like an image name. And then the engine will figure out which actual image layers it needs to pull, which is really cool. Um, and then, yeah, so you have to push that to the registry. And just um, kind of a tip is that there's not yet a docker manifest tag command, so if you're going to use another registry, like a foreign, not regular docker registry to push this to, go ahead and do the create and do the name of it or the IP address, however you're referencing it, and call it that when you do the create. It's kind of a gotcha that you don't have to do with docker images, because you can always re-tag one later, but you can't do that with the manifest yet, but hopefully you'll add that later. Um, and then the last thing that you can do is inspect. Oh, did you have a question? No. Okay. So yeah, you can inspect one. So this is an inspect of that manifest list that we made, and this is an inspect of just an image. Um, and Chris will also show you that when he does the demo. I didn't want to put all that on the slide. It's a lot. So yeah. Okay. So I have a question. Um, I've been um, using Docker Swarm for about a year, so we have our own private registry. So either like, you know, we use Nexus as an artifactory. So when we like create our images and push and pull it, would the naming convention be the same for this manifest if you're using the private registry? As long as the private registry is a Docker registry yeah. underneath, then yeah, it's gonna all work the same. The same convention, naming convention. Yeah, okay. you just wanna put the name of the registry first and then just like when you do Docker images. Yeah, the only thing that I've run into is that I'm not going to name any names because they pay me, but um, yeah. our the one registry has like an API wall in front of the registry itself, so you can't just access the registry oh, directly. I, I, I use both of them, so they got their own little parties. Yeah, so they haven't put in the manifest list support yet into their little API wall. Okay. So even though it's back, the support is there behind the wall, you can't actually use it. So if there's something like that in front of the registry that you're using, then it won't work, but I mean, it's easy to find out, <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, okay. Is there like a workaround or something? Um, I mean, no, if they haven't put that support into their API. They probably will, maybe soon, if, you know. All right, put a ticket out for them. 
Yep. <laughs> Good question. Uh, so I'm a much more visual person, so let's take everything Christy said and put it all together into a little demo. Uh, so first I'll show you sort of like the overall what I'm going to do. So I have a sample project here that this is just the directory layout of it. I have three separate Docker files, one ARM1, one, one C1, one x86 one. All these Docker files do, uh, they're exactly the same except for two things. The first thing is the from image is different. So the ARM one has a from armhf slash Ubuntu, the Z one has a from s390x slash Ubuntu, and the x86 has just from Ubuntu. Uh, and these Docker files, what the actual Docker file does is build a server and then serve a static image. And the actual static image that it's going to be serving is going to be different for each architecture. But don't worry too much about that part right now. So let me go straight into it. Nope, still have to end the slideshow first. So the buttons. Let's go here. Okay. Go to my directory real fast. Okay. So I do an ls, and as you can see, I have three Docker files. I named one of them ARM32v6 instead of ARMHF, but that's still the ARM Docker file. So we can take a look at, let's say, the x86 one. Okay, as you can see, it says from Ubuntu, and then it basically installs Go, exposes some ports, and then serves an image. For the sake of time, I have actually already pushed these. So I built each one of those Docker files and built, or sorry, I built them and then pushed them to Docker Hub. But essentially, the end goal is we're going to create a Docker manifest list, which is what she was just talking about, called TOFJ Demo, or you know, it doesn't matter what's named. Uh, I am TOFJ, by the way. If you're confused by any of that that nonsense, uh, that refers to my repository on Docker Hub. So we're going to create a manifest list called TOFJ slash Demo, and it is going to point to three images. One is the Z image, which the icon's on the left. The second is the ARM image, which is in the middle. And the third is the x86 or Intel one, which is on the right. So let me show you that real fast. OK, so first we will create the manifest. So Docker manifest create. Then the name of the manifest we want to create. OJ slash. You know, let's just use demo, just so all the slides are correct. And now I'm going to reference the, th the three images that I just showed you. These are already in my, uh, my Docker. So we'll reference, say, the ARM one, ARMHF slash demo. And that is the ARM specific one. And then the S390X specific one. And then the hardest to type, the X8664 one. We'll cross our fingers that I typed everything correctly. And that created that, that manifest. So if you remember, Christy said that we can also inspect the manifest. So let's go ahead and do that. Do a Docker manifest inspect. That is actually kind of tiny. OK, that should be a little bit better. So we will do a Docker manifest inspect of tobj slash demo, which is the manifest list I just created. And this is more or less what it looks like. You can see uh, there's three images in it. You can see uh, OS Linux and ARM for the first one, OS Linux S390X, or Linux slash S390X for the second one, and Linux slash AMD64 for the last one. Next, let's, uh, let's annotate something. Um, let's change the OS field of the ARM one to Darwin. Why not? So we can do a Docker manifest annotate. Uh, then we will say what the manifest list object was called, this tofj slash demo. Then we can reference the arm image, tofj slash arm hf slash demo. Then we'll tell it what to do. Say OS Darwin. Okay, it appeared to work. Let's manifest inspect it again. Hey, look, the architecture now says arm and Darwin. Yes. Okay, so now we can finally push it. Docker manifest push. I mean, Darwin Arm does work. It's, but that it's, isn't a Darwin image. Huh? Nobody tried to actually use that image. Oh, yeah, if you're on, if you're on <laughs> Arm, you probably shouldn't actually try to run that Arm one. 
So if you annotate something, it doesn't magically change what's in it. It just relabels it. It just so relabels it. So that would have pulled out correctly. But it was a good example. I probably should fix it then. <laughs> so uh, you can see that it, it pushed uh, the manifest and all the layers in it. So, okay. Back to the, the swarm part of this demo. Um, I am going to take that Docker manifest list object and I'm going to create a service and point it to that object. So I have a swarm here. Got this nifty visualizer that the nano marks made. Um, essentially, this node on the right is an x86 node, and this node on the left is a system Z node. And make this a little bigger. So right now I'm on the x86 one. It is the leader, so that's good. Um, there are no services at the moment. Yes, there are no services at the moment. And now I can do a Docker service create that I'm going to reverse search because it's really long to type. Uh, Docker service create, we'll call it Docker demo, set the mode as global, forwards and ports, and we point it to this tofj slash demo object at the very end. So. Once I do this, it is going to send to the swarm, okay, we're going to run this service under this manifest list. And the S390X one is going to pull down its S390X image reference from that manifest list, and hopefully <laughs> the x86 one does the same. So I will do that. You can see on the right, uh, yep, both of these nodes are now up and running as they are now green. And it's really hard to say, but it actually says state running. So now we can actually look at the application that was in the Docker files in the first place. So this is where you want to, to pray to the demo gods that all of the networking has worked. Uh, if you guys go to docker.tokj.us, this should hit my load balancer, and you should get one of either two images. You should get this image, which is huge. Uh, <laughs> And this is the x86 image. So on that x86 Docker file, if you remember, how I told you that there are two differences between the Docker files, one was the front image and the other was the static image that it served, this is the x86 image. And if I refresh it again, we cross our fingers that it loads eventually. Well, if you try this on your own machine, you will eventually hit the Z1. swarm demo, and I have a bunch of slides that basically just said exactly what I did. So, back to Christy. So that is the slightly smaller version of our demo from DockerCon. We had a Raspberry Pi and, and a, power, a box. power box in our demo at DockerCon. But those are a lot harder to get than you would think. So we happen to have access to a Z1. Yeah, the, the lab networking is for getting cloud service providers, getting four different ones to talk to each other. It's just, it, it takes a while. Yeah. Blame the networking team. Always blame the networking team. So, um, yeah, so I mean, the really cool part about that Swarm demo is that really there were no changes to Swarm made. You just make, like, Swarm didn't, the, you know, Swarm project didn't add any extra code anywhere to say, like, oh, this is a manifest list. Because it uses the Docker engine under the covers. You just give it a manifest list when you create the service, and then it is, the engine does the right thing, and the Swarm service just did the right thing, so. Mm -hmm. What about support for Docker build? Um, Being able to have a from, from a manifest? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, so that's, that's support. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so now that you've seen the demo, I'm sure everybody wants to definitely do this in their projects and have multi-arch everything, everywhere. So uh, just some ways that you can build yourself um, architecture specific images and put them all into a manifest list since now you know how to build manifest lists here's just some ideas about how you can get yourself a you know power pc cc4 little indian image for yourself or an s390x1 so there obviously you can have the actual hardware you can go off and buy a mainframe just so that you can build docker images for for us to use that would be great um they're getting cheaper <laughs> yeah 
Those are actually slightly different architecture than, I mean, and I, I don't know if anyone, I'm sure somebody out there has got Docker working on one of those. But yeah, I had one in my office and I got rid of it. I was like, it's just, it's so pretty, but I can't keep it. So, nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, actual hardware, always, always a plus. Um, but if you don't want to go buy all of those things, um, I just, you, KVM's not going to help you out, but I did put it on this slide because I wanted to contrast KVM versus QMV. So you can use full system virtualization, so you can have a power VM running on an x86 server if you virtualize the whole thing top to bottom using QMV, which is slightly different from just using KVM to do um, virtualization. So you can you do this. It's going to be pretty slow and cumbersome, um, but you can build Docker images that way or whatever you want to build that way. Um, or there's also something cool in Linux called user mode emulation, which I went into a lot more probably confusing detail about at DockerCon. Um, and it pretty much just looks at the elf binary and looks at that magic number that we ran into a problem with earlier um, and will let you run an image from another architecture on your system. So you sort of say, you know, you download a bunch of emulators, a bunch of QMU emulators and then say here are all the magic numbers that correspond to whichever emulator you want to run or whichever image you want and it, then the operating system figures it out and will run another binary on their system which is really cool and not endorsing Red Hat by any means but their fork of Docker has a bind mount option on Docker build so if you wanted to build Docker images, you could bind mount in the emulator when you do the Docker build and build a Power or Raspberry Pi image using Docker build if you use the Red Hat fork, which I know some people do. And there's a pull request out there still in Docker, and they didn't close it. They did close it? They closed it. Okay, well, they're looking for a very compelling use case, and apparently just building other images is not a compelling enough use case to them right now. We'll work on it. But that's another way that you can do it. Or the very last and probably easiest one is just cross-compiling. So you can cross-compile something. It's really easy to go. Um, and then just shove it into a Docker image using a Docker file and Docker copy and then push that out to Docker Hub. So there are lots of options for building images of other architecture. And um, I'll just run through a couple of tips for if you want to do this, like how to set up your projects and make it easier for you to build. Um, what This is Docker's structure. They have lots of Docker files, one for each architecture that they support, and also platform. This is where I should have explained earlier that it's not just architectures. There's Darwin, there's Linux, there's Windows, which I tried to, to get Docker working on Windows and I can't. I just, it was, it was a struggle and I gave up. Not because of how anybody did anything wrong, I've just I've forgotten how to Windows. It's been so long. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it. It's me. It's not that it's me. So there's a Docker file for everything that you can run Docker on in the Docker project. Um, and you can, like, just some tips is that don't, try not to hard code things in your Docker file. Repository names, like, especially Debian repository, they have a cool thing where you can say in brackets arch equals, and so you can say arch equals some argument and have a power architecture repository added in your Docker file if you just want to have one and try to just parameterize everything. That's a way to go. Um, so some options for your project and building things. And then the last thing I wanted to do is kind of suggestion, also kind of a, a request that if you have a project and you have optimized it for the platform that you think everybody's going to run your project on, and you have put a lot of assembly in your project, maybe consider a slow path kind of option where you use maybe if defs or build constraints if you're using Go, which is the example that I have on this slide. So this is another Docker file example. And I don't mean Docker file with a capital D. This is zfs.go, which is a file in the Docker repository. And this is the build constraints that they have for this file. So this means you'll build this file if you're running Linux or FreeBSD SLRs. Then you'll build this file if you're running not Linux and not FreeBSD and not SLRs. So those are some things you could do. You could put 
victim. That word that I forget that I just said. Attack. No. Build your strength. No. Assembly. I have a really <laughs> hard time with that word for some reason. It goes out of my head. So if you put your assembly in here, you can put in a slow path sort of thing and then <coughs> support it or what, you know, you can call it underscore slow path, whatever you want to do. And then if somebody comes along and says, I would like to use your project and just go build it, it won't be a disaster that we suddenly have to find ourselves porting a bunch of assembly code for. So just a suggestion. Um, also, I want, ways to do. I want to interject. Also, syscalls. If you have any package that uses syscalls, please do this too. Yes. Ugh. Anyway, <laughs> I won't go into syscall nightmares right now. So, um, yeah, so then there's a link at the end that will link you to lots of really good resources. There are a lot of projects out there that have done a lot of really cool things. In the multi-architecture world, there is a project that's just called MultiArch, which has um, built a lot of the emulators. Actually, I think for every conceivable architecture, they've built an emulator, and you can just download them all. Um, so stuff like that. There's a lot of good resources here if you go to that URL. And um, then all of these things were just because I was at DockerCon and scared of putting a Raspberry Pi logo on my slide and didn't want anybody to see me. So sources of images um, and the gophers that we used. And that's it. If there are any questions, then definitely take those. All right. Thanks, guys.